Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, a very disappointing week for the Flames. And after uh, the Minnesota game, Daryl Sutter was asked if he thought the Flames were justified in booing. And Matt, you and I are booing right now, too. Yep, uh, that was a, a very much a statement game where, you know, the management and team showed a lot of faith by not selling off guys. And they put an effort up where they got one scoring chance in the game. And. I think it's a statement uh, only week like, Flames. Yeah, like only three players showed up in that game. So, cool. Good well, for you. Well, let's, and, re- let's rewind yeah. and talk about the Boston game first. Uh, as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt talking about the f- week of Flames hockey that was. And Flames started this week by taking on the Boston Bruins. And this should have been a statement game, right? This is the game where we got to see what the Flames look like taking on the best team in the league. And to their credit, the Flames took it to overtime and got one point out of this one. What did you think of their effort here? Well, this was a very good effort, and the, this is part of like why, like throughout this season, I've been commenting about where like this team just has to get going because you can see efforts like this where playing the best team in the NHL, one of the best teams in NHL history, and thoroughly trounce them, out shooting them fifty-eight to twenty. You know, and, like, if not for Allmark's heroics, like, that should have been, like, an 8-2, 8-3 game for the Flames. And, it, you know, it, they couldn't finish, and they did manage to rally back and take the lead in the third period, coughed it up late, and once again, lose in overtime, the same old familiar script. And you know what, to be honest, I mean, the Buffalo, the Buffalo, or sorry, the Boston Bruins were not playing their A game. This was not the the Bruins that have been so dominant this year. They were on a back-to-back, and it was very evident that they weren't playing their top games. So that was even more reason that Calgary should have been able to jump on and dominate. Yeah, and like this should have been one of those where you know we needed the two points, and we should have got the two points. And uh, Flames have now lost six out of seven. Um, it, it, a couple of overtime games in there, but... You know, they're just not doing enough to actually win hockey games. And, you know, for as good of chances they were getting and how often Olmark was stopping them, you still have to find a way to shut the other team down and actually capitalize on your scoring chances. And I have a feeling this was probably the game that uh, settled for management where we're at going into the deadline. Oh, for sure. And it, it's... You know, like heading into that, like the that was loss number four out of five heading into the trade deadline, and like we've seen with the Ottawa Senators because they were basically in the same boat that the Flames were at the same time, and like they're on like a five or six game winning streak themselves, and like asked management to like we're gonna go for it, and this team does not seem to have any passion or care. No. Well, uh, trade deadline came and went, and the night of trade deadline, the Calgary Flames played against the Toronto Maple Leafs, um, uh, another game where I think we were excited to see what could be for the Flames against the top team in the league, and once again, the Flames came up short in this one, a uh, two to two to one loss to the Maple Leafs in regulation. What were your thoughts on this one? Uh, it's going to be the same with the Minnesota game where Jacob Markstrom was great. In this game, I think this Toronto game could have been his best game of the year. Yeah, it was easily, and he showed up. He was the only guy to do so, and you know, like the rest of the team was invisible, and you know, like Toronto didn't need much, um, you know, because as long as they got two by marks from, you know, like the Flames had no pushback at all. And Sorry, this game it, was not on deadline day. This was the day before deadline day. Yes. And uh, you know what? Uh, I, I had joked going into deadline day. I said, wow, the Calgary Flames acquired an NHL caliber goaltender last night. I know. And it's like, cool. Uh, you know, like if this was marks from all year, the Flames are probably leading the division right now. But that's, you know, it, it's one of those where you need the players and the goalie to both actually show up. And... Just because the goalie showed up doesn't mean that the players get a night off. And, 
you know, the results the same. They lost. Yeah, I think this was this to me when I watched this game and when I watched the clips back of this game, this feels to me like a very Calgary Flames game. They had some brilliant spots, they had some good stuff they did, but in the end they really didn't put together forty or even sixty minutes of hockey to, you know, be able to get everything going. Yeah. And then uh, Hockey Night in Canada, the first game after the trade deadline, and we saw one new Calgary Flame in the lineup. That was Troy Stetcher, who wore number 51 for the Flames and was uh, patrolling the blue line in a 3 nothing loss to the Minnesota Wild Saturday night, which, as we mentioned off the top, the Calgary Flames were booing the team afterwards. Yeah, this one we actually had a couple of players play well. I thought Mackenzie Weger, uh, Troy Stetcher, Chris Tanev, and Jacob Markstrom all had good games. All guys in the back end. Yep, and we had one scoring chance all game, which was the Toffoli breakaway, which, you know, bravo, you know, nice way to make a statement of exactly where you are as a team, you know, and that that shows everything that you need to say about this year's Flames. When right the media, when Eric Francis asked Daryl Sutter after the game what he thought of the booing, he said, I'd boo too. And, I mean, when your coach is saying that, I think that says something about his frustration level. He said that he didn't think they were booing the team, but that they needed to, uh, they needed to, their best players needed to be better. Um, well, and that's entirely the case. Like, the fourth line actually played reasonably well for them. You know, like, you're not going to get you know, a ton out of Lucic, Lewis, and Dewar, but I thought that was actually the best line for the team. But uh, Kadri was invisible, Huberdo was invisible, Lindholm was invisible, Toffoli was invisible, Dubé was invisible, Majapani was invisible, Backman was invisible, Colin was invisible, Peltier was invisible. What do you do with that? Like, the, you know, you generate one scoring chance all game. I don't care what team you are, like, that's just not acceptable flat, period, end of story. And, you know, I mean, every team has a bad game once in a while. But for me, I think this one is just after so many losses and, uh, you know, on a team that's looking, you know, at the playoffs from the outside. This, I think, stung a little bit more. Yeah, well, you're supposed to show some actual desperation and give a damn level, you know, at some point. Um, Like, be a professional athlete. Uh, You know, just little things. And... Uh, and I think for a lot of these players, yeah. it's probably good this happened after the deadline because I could see this being a frustration that might have, you know, caused someone to maybe get moved out of town. Oh, for sure. And like if this had been the Toronto game or the Boston game, like, yeah, that would have been, uh, yeah, there's no excuse to keep you people <laughs> at this point. But Matt, when was the last time this season we said Markstrom had two games in a row they looked good? Like, to me, if we take nothing else out of this week, we got two NHL caliber starts out of Jacob Markstrom. Well, he looked like Markstrom from last year, the last two games. And, you know... Vesna caliber Jacob Markstrom. Yeah, uh, which, great, awesome, cool. You know, I have zero complaints about him. He did an awesome job coming in relief in the Boston game. And all week, he's been great. I have zero problem with Markstrom. If he plays like this, they actually do still stand a slight chance. You know, if the rest of the team can get their head out of their posterior, um, then, you know, like, it... But, yeah, it's one of those where, like, the whole team needs to wake up. You know, like, you're you're actual professional athletes. um, Maybe you should show it. He and his wife recently had a child, and I have to wonder if maybe the pressure or anxiety of that child coming might have had something to do with his year. Because, yeah. like, well, the, well, ki- especially the kid's born, his... and all of a sudden he looks better. Yeah, well, especially um, with the adventures and horrors that his best buddy, uh, Elias Lindholm, has gone through with multiple miscarriages and, 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 you know, like, you know, uh, like the stress of all of that, uh, uh, you know, and the fact that being a professional athlete, you're around people all the time and COVID's a thing and, you know, the fear of passing that on and, and, and like it, it's, you know, I'm sure that his head wasn't in the game fully and I'm grateful that everything went well and, you know, the, everything everybody's healthy and okay um you know that is far more important than any hockey game at any point you know and like even if this whole season it does not materialize in anything good 
you know, I will still be grateful for the fact that, you know, both Lindholm and Markstrom's families got through the this ordeal on off the ice. And the well, fact we're seeing Markstrom bounce back now after this, I think shows some hope for next year. Some promise that yeah. he can go back to Vesna form. Yeah, and I think that like with this season where like basically luck has not been a thing for the Flames. Like you saw the two nothing goal against Minnesota. Like that was the strangest plinko ball, <laughs> random like bounced off eight things to go in. You know, it's like if it could go wrong, it will for yeah. this team this year. You know, sometimes seasons like this happen. Like the 2015-2016 season was very similar to this year where like just no bounces were going the team's way which ended up working out well that's how they got Matthew Kachuk which you know was a big deal for this team and still is uh with Huberto and Uyghur being a part of the team and you know like if the Flames similarly flounder through the, re the remaining 19 games and end up with the top 10 pick well you know, all the guys in the top 10 are, are guys that are of, like, that that same talent level of the 2016 draft. So, you know, like, the Flames will be walking away with a very dynamite prospect. So, even though... I don't you know, want them to tank, and I, I'm against no, tanking neither, in sports. No, neither but am could I. Could you imagine if the Flames were to fall into 10th, somehow win the lottery, and out of all this, from a bad s situation, the Calgary Flames get Connor Bedard? Uh, I think that everybody'd be like, "Yeah, that this season was awesome." <laughs> we'd be willing to forgive it, right? Oh, we would be cheering it, you know, in hindsight. We'd be like, "Yeah, you did everything right. Perfect. Awesome." <laughs> that's right. Look, that Huberto trade was fantastic and, you know, that's when Tree just sits there and looks at us and says, "We knew it was coming." Yeah. <laughs> we it knew. It's part of the plan. Yes. Um, I am a wizard after all. That's right. He he just waves his hands and the ball's go in his order. Yeah. When when Bill Daly reaches in and grabs Chicago ball, he says, "That's not the ball you were reaching for." Yep, exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, but with, with with the Flames where they are, they are still outside that top ten right now. Thankfully, uh, the Flames have played sixty three games. They have twenty seven wins, twenty three losses, and thirteen overtime losses. So that's still what thirty six total losses for a total of sixty seven points. Um, Nashville's at sixty eight, and the last team in the wild card is Colorado at seventy three. So. That hole is getting bigger and bigger for the Calgary Flames well, right now. Well, and the, the thing is, is that the Flames have one of the easiest schedules in the league. And well, we've the been guys saying that for months. I know. And the guys around us, um, Colorado, Nashville, Winnipeg, they all have among the hardest schedules in the NHL. So if Markstrom plays like this and the, the rest of the team does show up, they are not actually mathematically eliminated from the playoffs and they could bounce back. That said, you actually have to show that you are capable of playing a hockey game, which recently the Flames have not been able to show that they can do. So, uh, yeah, I would be... Uh, frankly, for the playoffs, I think that the Flames have about a 3% to 5% chance at this point. And, you know, like if uh, they go on a winning streak, then maybe... Uh, but like the the time for that is up until this week. I end. still thought there was hope. Looking at these three games they played, honestly, Matt, I'll tell you, and it pains me as a Flames fan to say it. I think they're done. Oh, same here. I, I'm holding out hope just for the fact that the schedules difference between all of the four teams. But yeah, like realistically, like I would not. No, like there's no chance that this group who's not shown any cohesion at all can actually muster towards, you know, even five games in a row where they actually know what they're doing. Yeah, and, and I think in some ways it might be better to not make the playoffs because I think we could get really embarrassed. Yeah, uh, well, how would you say this year's playoffs, all the teams in the West suck, all the good teams are in the East, so... I, I'm not going to say that, you know, we'd necessarily get embarrassed because like if the flames face the uh, Vegas, we'd probably beat Vegas. If we know. actually were hot enough to get into the playoffs, I think we would actually beat Vegas, but you know, like there's a lot of teams that are just bad in the West. So it, it, it's one of those where if they, they got there, 
maybe they might, you know, I don't think they would be an easy, like, four or five game series out where, you know, but, yeah, I, I'm more lending to the fact that I think organizationally it might be better for the team to miss just due to the, frankly, the strength of this year's draft and the Flames having a huge hole in the prospect pool and, you know, they need some forward help and it's there are a ton too. of, you know, well, frankly, the D are all youngish that are on the blue line for the Flames. So, it, you know, and they're good enough. Like, there's not, like, a glaring need. Whereas, like, they need some scoring, frankly. And, you know, like, if you can get a top-tier prospect from this draft, even if it's a guy that goes 10th, 11th, like, that guy will be, like, basically the Flames' top prospect at that point. And you know, a possible first line forward for the team. So, you know, like that, that would be a huge ad organizationally. Well, right now, moneypuck.com predicts the Flames have a 33.7% chance of making the playoffs. And we talked about the two big uh, teams that the Flames are involved with in the summer. Florida, even worse, at 17.8%. And of course, the Columbus Blue Jackets, 0%. So, well, and the reason why it's 33% is literally just due to the fact that the flame schedule is laughably easy yep. after the next two games and everybody else is playing the gauntlet of all the good teams. So, yeah, you know, there is an opportunity if they can get their stuff together, but you know, clock's ticking very quickly <laughs> and you know, well, Matt, I think we should focus on the trade deadline. Yep. Going into the trade deadline on Friday, the Calgary flames were the only team in the NHL that hadn't made a trade this year, which I thought it was kind of an interesting stat that we've seen so much movement. Everybody's made done something and the flames sat there and did nothing and continue to do nothing. And it wasn't really until almost just at the deadline that we learned that the flames made two trades. Uh, the first trade, the Calgary flames moved Radham Zahorna to the Toronto Maple Leafs in exchange for right winger Dryden hunt. And he's a, uh, Cranbrook BC prospect. He's going to be reporting to, the Calgary Wranglers actually has already played in one Wranglers game and has two points, so good start for Hunt there. Uh, left shot, but he's a guy who's playing right wing, and I think probably a winger that they need right now. And you and I talked about potentially bringing in some some uh, veteran help or let's say some established AHLers for the uh, the Wranglers. And then the Flames made another trade and made history. When was the last time the Calgary Flames made NHL Well, actually, uh, this might be a, a double first. If Hunt ever comes up with the Flames and manages to score a goal for Calgary, he will be the first player to score a goal for four separate teams in the same season. Interesting. He'll only be the sixth guy ever to play for four teams in the same season, but he'd be the first guy to actually score for all four. Interesting. Well, that's history that could be made, but we have history that was made. Can you believe that in the, what, 100-plus years of the NHL, no brother has ever been traded for another brother? And even True Living said he assumed at some point there was how many Sutter brothers? One got traded for another, but it's never happened until 3.14 p.m. Eastern on March 3rd, 2023, when the Calgary Flames traded Nick Ritchie and, or sorry, Brett Ritchie and Connor Mackey to the Arizona Coyotes for Nick Ritchie and Troy Stetcher. Yeah, it's like, hey, Brett, we like you, but you suck compared to your brother, so we're getting him instead. Well, and, and it's so, I always think it's cool when your team comes up with a milestone, but when we look back at this 10 years from now, people are going to be like, who? Like, the Richie brothers are not going to be, you know, they're not the Stahl brothers, they're not the Sutter no. brothers, they're not going to be NHL names that we know, you know, 10 years from now. Yeah, I remember uh, flashbacks uh, to the 2014 draft, uh, getting into arguments on Calgary Puck on. Who was better, Sam Bennett, uh, Nick Ritchie, or Nikolai Ehlers? And, you know, at the time I was like Nick Ehlers, and I was right with that. But, you know, it's nice to see that the Flames did get... I always figured that because he's pretty much a prototypical Flames-type player, that at some point that Nick Ritchie would join the team. And, yeah, he, he will fit right in. Well, let's let's break these guys down. So for those that don't know, Nick Ritchie's the younger brother. Brett is 29 and Nick is 27. Nick Ritchie was actually a top 10 pick. He was drafted number 10 in 2014 by Anaheim. He's spent most of his career in Anaheim. He's also played for the Blues, the Maple Leafs, and the Coyotes. His best season was the 18-19 season when he had a 31-point season with Anaheim. 
Um, a guy who I think we can all say probably hasn't turned out the way that he was expected to, but I would say a very serviceable NHLer. Yeah, he's the type of guy who will be good for a while, then just absolutely disappear for a month, and then he'll be good for a while. And yeah, he's just very inconsistent from day to day, game to game. But um, he basically brings all the same kinds of things that uh, Milan Lucic does: some physicality, some offensive ability. You know, just decent overall play. Um, you know, like I, I frankly think this is an audition for next season. Uh, I think for uh, both him and Stetcher, it is. Yeah. To well, here, here's 20 games. You know, we we'd like you to come back, and if you're good enough, and we'll see. And you know, uh, I would not be opposed to either Stetcher or Richie coming back um, because of the fact that. Uh, they have a long enough resume, and with Lucic likely departing at the end of the year, that um, getting somebody to replace that generic type of player, I think, will be necessary, even though he Richie might not necessarily play every game. I think that both uh, players are going to take a pay cut. Yeah. Oh, for but- sure. Like, I think that, uh, like, Richie's probably in the million-dollar range, and... Uh, Stats are probably in the one and a half to two range. Because right now, Richie's making, I think, $1.25 million, And Stetcher is, uh, or sorry, Stetcher's $1.25 million, And I think that is even uh, maybe a little rich based on where he'll be. And Richie's 2.5. So there's no way he's making 2.5 next year. That's Dylan Dubé money no. on this team. Yeah, no. The, the, both are like closer to league minimum. Yeah, I Which, think I think both guys have probably seen their best paydays at this point. Yeah. Well, let's talk um, about Stetcher, Stetcher before we go much yeah. further, shall we? Yeah, Stetcher, I, he's just a decent all-around defenseman. Not great at any one particular thing, not bad at any one particular thing, and to me would be like the ideal number seven defenseman on this team uh, moving forward. Uh, he played effectively yesterday. Um there was no complaints. I, I liked him all the way back when he was with Vancouver. He was one of a few players that I actually liked on that team, um, which, oddly, we've got most of them now. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Tanev. Uh, That's right. <laughs> uh, Troy Stetcher's a right-shot defense, which they've wanted. He comes from Richmond, B.C., 28 years old. He's 5'10", uh, 170, uh, sorry, 184 pounds. And like Matt said, he started in the league as an undrafted prospect playing 2016-2017 uh, with the Canucks. His best season was his rookie season. Since then, he's played with Detroit, L.A., and now less than one season with or yeah, less than one season with Arizona, and now with the Flames. And I think as a 28-year-old, again, you're probably you know sort of at your peak. I could definitely see this guy coming back, and I I think that you know if you're going to have him as the number seven, the question is they finally move on from Michael Stone in the offseason. Yeah. I don't think. That I didn't think that day would ever happen. Um, yeah, I think that that has finally come for the Flames to start moving on from a bunch. You, of people. you know what I think is going to happen there? I think Michael Stone will sign an AJL deal with the Wranglers and still be here. I would not be surprised. <laughs> like he just he, he's he's not go, he's not going anywhere. Yeah, but yeah, I think at, you know at less than a million, I think Stetcher would be a perfectly serviceable number seven. I like him. He's. I think he's a responsible defenseman, and I think he's the kind of guy that, I mean, he's been around the league for a while. He plays, he didn't play a whole lot in uh, 2021, 16 games, 13 the year after, and then this year, 61, but he's the kind of guy that can play a lot of games. And I think the guy, you don't necessarily want him in your roster every night, but the kind of guy like Stone, who when he when he has to jump in, you know that he'll do it and he'll do his job well. Yeah, and frankly, um, for this team, uh the trade that they made, uh, like Brett Ritchie was not going to be re-signed by this team, more than likely, and Connor Mackey was not going to be brought back. So, is it, it fair to say Connor Mackey went from a prospect to organizational depth this year? Pretty much that one game right at the beginning of the season where he basically single-handedly cost the team a win. Uh, that to me uh, basically ended the whole prospect portion of well, his... you and and you and I had said earlier this season that we were surprised that Mackey was you know still playing for the flames we thought we'd seen the end of him yeah and at the time like it was out of necessity and Gilbert to his credit has stepped up and 
kind of taken that seventh role now. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, basically the Flames gave away nothing and got to audition to people for next year, which in my mind is a win. And yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Dennis Gilbert I could see coming back. I think he's a, a guy the Flames have been pleasantly surprised with, and I think he played Mackey out of a job. I think Mackey, sort of like um, Valamacki, probably needed a change of scenery to show if he can be an NHLer, and what a better place than Arizona to do that. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's where, like, you know, in all sports, where – Teams that are, you know, trying to be competitive, like they don't necessarily have the time or space for guys to learn on the job. And, you know, um, and that's where moving guys to bad teams so that way they can learn on the job is a good thing. And, you know, like in baseball, there's the Rule 5 draft where, you know, more deep teams have to lose people to the bad teams. Just Similar because to the old waiver draft for the NHL. Yep, exactly. And it in very much the same way Mackey and Val Mackey going to Arizona is symptomatic of that where, you know, the Flames just did not have room for those guys to learn on the job and yeah. Yeah, and and I think here the Flames when I look at this, I would say that of that trade, the one with Arizona, Calgary probably won that for what we needed. I think Calgary needs uh, I think Troy Stetcher is the better defenseman. I think if you look at sort of Mackey for Stetcher, I think we won that one. And I think Brett Ritchie for Nick Ritchie, I think Nick Ritchie fills a role the Flames needed to fill, whether now or next year. Yeah, and, uh, you know, like, realistically... Uh, with and I think how Brett well, Ritchie can be replayed, replaced by Walker Dewar for what he does in the team. Yeah, I, um, and even uh, Living said that uh, they moved Brett uh, to make room for Walker Dewar, and to Dewar's credit, he has been an extremely effective fourth-line player for this team, and perhaps the best of all of the fourth liners thus far this year. And he'll need to just keep it up and try to take those next steps because with his foot speed, you know, he will be a very effective player for this team moving forward. I think that we know what we're getting in three of these players. I think Nick Ritchie has the most upside of these guys that we're bringing in, but he needs to figure out how to be consistent. Mm -hmm. And if he can figure out how to be consistent then I think the Flames are really going to benefit from this trade. If he doesn't, well, I mean, again, it's 20 games and he's either, um, you know, out at the end of the year, or even if you bring him back as an inconsistent number 13, I think there's, he's going to find a job either way. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Like Richie is not going to be playing himself out of a job in the NHL. Uh, m much like uh, how um, the guy from uh, training camp uh, who played badly um can't remember his name off the top of my head was the guy that sonny milano yeah there you go where like he was terrible uh during uh training camp and has carved out a decent season with the capitals yeah, yeah. like yeah he'll find, he'll find a job like even if he sucks badly here he'll find a job mm -hmm. elsewhere and play more or less what he normally does or he'll get sent to the minors after next year but that's a Next I think, year thing. Yeah, I think Nick Ritchie, especially being a top 10 pick in the past, those guys tend to hang around the NHL for a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. I agree. And then let's look at that Toronto deal. A lot of people that I saw online, uh, both fans and media, a little bit um, questioning this one here. Redeem Zahorna was a waiver pickup from the Flames in the offseason. He came from the P Pittsburgh organization. He's looked really good with the Wranglers this year. In 40 games, he has tw 29 points. Uh, he played eight games with the Flames, and I think everybody liked him. Why do you think they decided to make that move for Dryden Hunt? Um, Hunt's better um, for the AHL, and uh, you know, just another offensive weapon. I think that uh, the Wranglers have missed Peltier being down there. Um, in the stretch run, and like they've been losing a few more games than they have been previously, uh, just due to Peltier's absence. And Hunt is much more of a higher end guy for the AHL, uh, whereas Zahorna is just a big body. Which I think that Zahorna for them, uh, they're more looking at, you know, if the NHL team needs depth in the playoffs, having a guy who's six foot seven makes a lot more sense. For sure, I think a lot of fans got caught up on Zahorna's size. Six yeah. foot six. And we've seen this with the Flames in the past. I mean, it reminds me of Keegan Kanzig, right? A big guy that really didn't play good hockey, 
but maybe it was kept around because he's a big guy. But I agree with you. I like Dryden Hunt as a player. I've liked him since I first saw him in Florida play. Um, yeah. I think I think that he's the better player of the two. And I mean, he's six foot. He's not a small man. But I think that if you're looking to go deep, which we've talked about, I think that you you want Dryden Hunt over Zahorna. Yeah, exactly. And Zahorna is like a good second, third line guy in the AHL where Hunt's a legitimate first line guy. Which, yeah. you know, both are useful for the pro teams in different ways, but, you know, for what the Flames are looking for, um, Hunt just makes a lot more sense for the niche that they're looking for. And I would not be surprised if Toronto doesn't sign Zahorna, and there might even be an opportunity to bring him back in the summer. Yeah, even then, it's a low priority, one way or the other. For sure. There's a lot of big guys who are AHL caliber guys. Yeah, like you can go sign, call, insert college free agent, you know, big, you know, guy here and to fill that generic role. So, you know, like there's a whole bunch of different avenues one way or the other. Dryden Hunt has actually had some NHL experiences here. He's played uh, 2023. He's played with the New York Rangers where he played three games and got one goal. He played with the Colorado Avalanche for 25 games, got one goal. Toronto Maple Leafs for nine games, got one goal. So maybe he'll come to the Flames and get one goal. Um, he played for the the Marlies of the AHL for 15 games and got nine goals. And again, two points and one game with the Wranglers. So I think bringing in a, a right winger, uh, or I guess he's a left winger, but he shoots left. I think that they need some more wingers there. And like you said, especially losing Peltier. But going deep in the playoffs, we've talked about, I think that the Wranglers going deep is important. And if, yeah. you know, even if Peltier is down there, you can't assume he's going to be healthy the whole playoffs. So I think Dryden Hunt's going to help with that. Yeah. If he does actually come up to Calgary and he scores, is his goal song going to be everywhere, man? <laughs> Could be. <laughs> or Around the World by, uh, oh, what was Daft that Punk. band in the 90s? Daft Punk. That's yeah. right. Yeah. It could, could be there as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think when I look at this, and I analyzed the day. De- oh, before we go on, I should say um, for the two guys on the Calgary Flames, Troy Stetcher is wearing number 51, and it looks like Nick Ritchie will not take his brother's number 24. I thought that would be too easy. Just, hey, we already have a Ritchie jersey. Go put it on. Um, he's going to be wearing number 27 for the team. Yeah. Or, you know, to go old school, he could have taken uh, Byron Ritchie's number 15. There back you go. From the, like, 2007. The unrelated Ritchie brother. Yep. Did Byron spell the same way? Uh, yeah. You're right, he did. Um, yeah, that, that could work as well, though I don't think they have any of those jerseys sticking around because that was a slightly different look for the team. Yeah. So overall, when I look at this trade deadline for the Flames, I think to me the, the Flames did exactly what they needed to be doing here. They, I think, made some minor moves. As GM uh, Treliving said, they worked around the edges and then they got better in areas where they could get better without giving up assets and draft capital, which you and I talked about last week. And yeah. looking at the prices, I'm glad they didn't buy. Yeah, well, you have to look at, you know, like where I've said, like, if it makes sense. And, like, with the selling of, you know, like, the Flames could have sold Lindholm or Backlund or Toffoli, but realistically you have to go get somebody in the off season to offset that guy. And, like, the guys that you would sell are on good contracts, so you're not going to get, like, the same value guy. And, like, this season being as much of a mess as it has been, you can go into the offseason, reset, and guess what? You have all of your key players back, and if the team is awful again next year, then you can sell. And you'll get basically the same price tags for all of the players that you would. Like, you'll get a late first-round pick plus for Backland. You'll get a first plus for Lindholm. Like, it it won't matter. Um, you'll still get the same level of asset if the Flames are terrible next year. Um, so, like, there's no urgency right now for this team to be like, oh, well, we must blow it up just because we're a few points out of the playoff spot. Like, it, it wouldn't make any rational sense. You know, it, it would be different if there were guys on expiring contracts, but realistically, they traded one of the 
three guys that had any value, the other two being Lewis and Lucic, and even then, those guys, like, you might have got, got a seventh-round draft pick, which, you know, losing Lewis and Lucic, it, not really worth it for that level of draft pick either. So, And I think the good thing they did here, and you mentioned earlier, they're getting guys that I could totally see being Calgary Flames. I think Troy Stetcher I could totally see as a flame. Nick Ritchie I could totally see as a flame. And they get an audition with those guys. Yeah. Oh, yeah, to, and it costs you literally nothing. Yeah, they get to bring them into the system. We get to see, you know, if they're guys we might want to keep next year. We get to see if they're guys that, um, you know, the, the Flames might want to bring back. I think it's I think it's win win here. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that idea. And for giving up, I mean essentially expiring contracts for expiring contracts, I don't see why you wouldn't do those kind of deals. Yeah, because realistically Mackie and Brett Ritchie were not gonna be coming back next year. No. You're you're opening up a spot for doer full time and and and. You know, there's no real downside. And like, I think that's the key there, is I think you know, Mackie, I don't think, wants to be a flame next year. I think that there's been some bridges burned there. And I think Brett Ritchie, you know, maybe he would come back. Maybe he wouldn't. But I think he's, again, a, a very – there's a lot of players like him. I mean, he wasn't signed by the Flames till after training camp when he originally signed here. I think he's a guy that isn't high on anyone's signing list. So, yeah, if you can prioritize some other guys, why not? Yep. Um, when was the last time at the deadline we saw expiring deals traded for expiring deals? I know. Uh, it, it's a weird one. And the Flames took on a lot of salary here. Like They took on almost $3 million in salary. They've now got 300000 left. But at this point, it doesn't matter. They were no. They were able to make it work. And, you know, I, I think for where they are, I think that's all they could do. Yeah. And, like, how would you say? Um, for this team to make the playoffs, like, Markstrom, how he's played the last three games, he has to play that way consistently the rest of the way. Huberto needs to figure out how to actually play like an NHL player. Um, Cadre needs to be more effective. And, you know, as the rest of the guys need to step up. And, you know, through the last six games, we haven't really seen very much of that. And, you know, it, it's on the team and you know whether the flames make the playoffs or they don't it's squarely on the players shoulders and you know it it's there for the taking it, you know it it's you got to actually put the effort in though some interesting notes here um actually um Dryden Hunt is living in Calgary his buddy from the Florida Panthers, um, Mackenzie Weger, who's been here all year, is actually living in Dryden Hunt's place while he first came to Calgary and getting settled in. So Dryden Hunt called him up and said, hey, I need my place back. So I, I'm, a, I'm pretty sure that Mackenzie Weger now can afford to buy his own place. I, I don't know. He, you know he, he's going to have to like dig in the sofa to get uh, some money together because you know, that contract hasn't kicked in yet. You know, and I mean, I understand not wanting to buy a place, you're new to a city, you want to figure out what you like, but um, I think that's kind of cool that, you know, you see those kind of things, an old friend helping you out with their place, and I think that's another thing I like about this deal, all these guys are familiar to each other, you know, Stetcher's played with, like you said, a lot of our guys in Vancouver, Hunt's played with a lot of our guys in Florida that came from over there, so we're bringing in guys that are very familiar. Yep. Yeah. Um, and especially moving forward, like this team needs to. Stetcher and Manji Penny played together in the World Championships. Yeah, like this team needs to get more cohesive. And, you know, like this team kind of looks a little bit of out of sorts all over the place. And it needs some binding together. And, you know, uh, and I'm sure that moves that will be made in the offseason, regardless of who for what and you know, what exactly the parameters are all for, um, all of those will, I think, will be more to try and get the chemistry right more so than, it, you know, because, like, how would you say, if Peltier continues to play as, like, a top six forward for this team moving into next season, then, like, the Flames really don't need any one specific thing heading into next year. It's more fit, more than... You know, and hoping that guys will bounce back, et cetera, et cetera. 
The Flames also made two other transactions on trade deadline day. They sent Peltier and Dewar back to the uh, Calgary Wranglers. And the only reason for that is you have to be on the AHL roster as of deadline day in order to be eligible for the playoffs there. So that was a smart move. I think yeah, in, the pa- in the past, it's you act- like, hey, you two, go to the room down well, that's the it. hall. You, you <laughs> actually, by league rules, have to report to that team. And if you remember a couple of years ago, they did that with Stone, I think. And he had to fly to Stockton, check in, and pretty much fly back home. So in this case, just go, go down the hall. That's right. Walk down <laughs> the hall. <laughs> let them know you're here. We're not even going to bring your bag and just come back. Like this is yeah. this is one of the reasons why the Flames won an American League team in Calgary because it makes all this stuff easier. Not even having to drive to Red Deer or somewhere like that. Same building, just you know what? Go over go there. Go to your room. <laughs> That's right. Take take a selfie, show you're here, and uh, you know, and come back. So so that they then recalled those guys before the Minnesota game. So that uses two of the Flames' four call ups are allowed after the deadline, bringing up Pelty and Dewar. And that tells me that they're expecting those two to probably stay with the team for the remainder of the season. Yeah, and that would make entire sense because they both earned it, frankly. And the only two guys, frankly, on the team in the for the Wranglers that I could see getting recalled even late in the season would be Matthew Phillips again and uh, Dustin Wolf. You don't think they'd give Zari a shot? Uh, no, uh, he's is still young and, you know, it, he lost him, a lot of last year to injury too. Yeah. I, I think just more consistency. That's one where if it was Zari, it'd be like, yeah, that makes sense too. Like the, the, it's flip a coin, but because Phillips is an expiring contract, they might want to see if, you know, maybe just forcing the issue to see if, you know, there's any need to bring him back or not. And more than those guys, I thought it was interesting that the uh, media availability that GM Brad Living did after the trade deadline, he talked about how they, they still had the option to put Oliver Shillington on IR for the year if they need to. I mean, I think it's fair to say he's not coming back now with 19 games left. No. But um, there was sort of a hint that they could put him on the IR if they wanted someone else to join the team. And reading between the lines, I think we'd all say that's Matt Coronado if he were to sign out of Harvard this year. So I think if you're going to be bringing up a guy like Phillips, I think it's more likely that if they're trying to bring in a young forward, it would be Coronado. And I, I hate these deals where they bring you in for you know one game to burn a year. That I just I don't like that as a fan. I understand why the players want it. So I'm kind of hoping he doesn't come for that reason. But um, that's, I, I, that's how would you say I, I would see them making. very much rather that than him not signing here so. for sure for sure but I think if you're gonna bring him in you know you get what ten games until your first year's burn like bring him in and have him play the last ten yeah well it depends on when Harvard season's done that's too. true yeah and and I think too I mean we've seen you know we've seen this with um, guys you know Adam Fox being the the biggest name. Guys whose sons don't want to sign with Calgary out of college. He actually said, um, Coronado, that he intends to sign with the Flames out of college, which I think is promising. But I agree with you. I'd rather do that than have him not sign here. But I'm pretty confident Coronado becomes a Flame. Yeah. And I I would like him to be here, even if it, you know, like if, say, the Flames are, you know, in the last games of a, you know, failed season type of thing then at least it gives the fans something to look forward to for next year as a possibility even though like the odds of coronado starting in the nhl next year are kind of small i think but you never know and and we also see players quite often who will join an american league team after their college season i could see that as well i could see this guy joining the wranglers for their playoff run yeah and you if know, the, the, honestly, like if the Flames did make the playoffs and Coronado did join the team, you know, I could see him actually playing in the playoffs, possibly if he shows well enough in his small time here, just like the Canadians had Caulfield that a couple of years ago in the all Canadian division or uh, Kale McCarr um, against us in the playoffs, that kind of thing, you know, it. If it makes sense, I could see that also being a possibility. And we've heard from GMs in the past that even just bringing in these young guys to, um, bringing in these young guys just to be around the team, be in the building, be a practice. There's a lot to learn there. So even if he didn't get that ice time, 
I think bringing him around would be good. But I think if you could add him to the Wranglers roster for a playoff run, I think that's a much more manageable transition from NCAA to AHL playoffs to NHL. Mm -hmm. I agree. But I agree with you. I don't think – I think fans are excited about Coronado. I don't think you need to rush him to the NHL, and I would be very surprised if he was a – if he were to sign this offseason, I'd be very surprised if he was a Calgary Flame next year. Yeah, uh, I fair to say I would agree. It, he would have to have a really good training camp and like push his way onto the team, which I, could happen. You know, it, it, I, at this point, like I'm not really gonna discount anything, uh, just because uh, you know, like nobody's really shown that they've earned spots necessarily for next year throughout the lineup. So, you know, it's. Uh, kind of like hitting a reset button in the off season and okay, now everything's up for grabs. Have fun. Well, the last story I thought I'd talk to you about is not so much with the players or uh, the management or anything like that, but with Blasty. And we don't often get a story about Blasty, but the Calgary Flames have been doing some really cool stuff this month with their Black History Month warm up jersey and now their Indigenous warm up jersey. The Calgary Flames are the last Canadian team to add a land acknowledgement to their pregame. Um, Ceremonies, and they did that for the Indigenous game that they just played, where they wore the Indigenous warm-up jerseys. What do you think of this version of Blasty? It, it's sort of like the Chicago Blackhawks got traded to the Calgary Flames. <laughs> a to me, bit. Uh, to me, it looks like I, I don't know. It, it, it looks like something that somebody just like opened up Photoshop and just pasted some elements together. Like even if you look at the very top, the the ear of Blasty doesn't seem like it fully fits together with the the leaves. It just looks like some clip art that somebody put together. Yeah. It's a very oddly designed uh, warm-up jersey, but, you know, it's good that the Flames are being inclusive now, and hopefully, uh, you know, that will co- those kinds of things will continue for this team because, you know, it, hockey is for everybody, and, you know, communities that support the team matter. For sure. And, I would know, have much those, rather they used what's their, their current Twitter logo on that, which I think is a far better indigenous logo for the Calgary Flames. I agree. But. And for those that are interested, this was the shoulder patch that you saw on the indigenous logo, or you can find it on their Twitter account right now at uh, twitter.com slash NHL Flames. I just, I like this better. I think this one with the flaming C in the middle, with the names of the nations around it, I think that's far better done than what looked like Blasty with just, you know, some, I don't know, it looked like a, a child's it, artwork. Yeah, it kind of looked like they stole some elements from the Chicago Blackhawks logo and just kind of clip art pasted it in. Yeah, there's <laughs> just, some weird new stuff on Blasty's face. I don't know, it just, it, it it looks like what I'd expect from an ECHL team when they do their weird jersey nights and they do like Star Wars night. It kind of looks like something like that. Yeah. You know, if you were to take the, I don't know, the, the Rapid City logo and put a, you know, a Star Wars helmet on or some something, something like that. Like, it just, it's not to the level I would expect. And I thought, you know, I didn't personally, I, I didn't personally resonate with the Black History logo, but I thought it was neat. And I thought it was a cool promotional logo. Um, but it still was a flaming C. Yeah. So I, I think, I don't know, that one I think was a lot better done than this one was. I'm... I'm glad they're doing something to, you know, honor the indigenous uh, history of Canada, but I just thought that it, it looked like it was thrown together last minute. Mm-hmm. I expect this team, I think Calgary of all the teams in the league, I think Calgary is one of the ones that does a really good job with their ceremonies. And I guess maybe because of that, it just felt like it wasn't up to par for what I'd expect from this organization. Yeah, it definitely seemed rushed because like it wasn't like they there was any real lead in to either of those really like being announced in the forefront like you know like normally like they kind of make a big deal of oh on this date and this date these things are happening like early in the season like uh you know when they celebrate the military personnel uh on whichever day they decide to do that you know like that's always kind of like telegraphed from beginning of the season and like you didn't really get any of that for either of those it was just like oh yeah we're doing this cool and, you know, just not the same depth of the presentation that it should have been. Yeah, I mean, I I, did, I wasn't in person for both ceremonies. From what I saw and what I heard, both ceremonies were well done. Yeah. But it just seemed like the, 
the jersey. It's almost like they... And they've done a lot of these things in the past where it's the same logo. Like, Military Day is never a new logo. It's, you know, they just put the black flaming C on a military jersey. And so I was kind of honestly surprised to see different logos for these because that's normally not what they do. Or Breast Cancer. They have the Flames logo on a pink jersey. Um, so maybe that's why. Maybe it's something they're, they're new to as an organization. Yep. Well, I think that about wraps up uh, Flames news for this week. Yeah. Matt, we're done talking Flames news, and that means we've got to look at the predictions. And sadly, your predictions came true last week. You won the prediction game with a three-loss three, three loss prediction. As much as I'm happy you won, I'm sad that that was the result. Uh, yeah. I, I thought we'd win Minnesota, lose Toronto and Boston. You were pretty sure the Flames would lose all three. And that means we have three more games to predict. We will record before the Ottawa game next Sunday. So that gives us uh, a short road trip back-to-backs Monday, Tuesday at Dallas, 6.30 start time, at Minnesota on Tuesday, 6 p.m. start time. And then the Calgary Flames come home on Friday to take on the Anaheim Ducks. Three games, what are you expecting? Three more losses. Wow. If that's the case, these guys are really out of the playoffs at that point. Yep. I how would you say it? They need to show it. And like there was no elements other than marks from this week. There was no elements of the game that you know, Dallas and um Minnesota are both actually competing for a playoff spot and you know, seeding and all of that, and the flames don't seem to care. So yeah, and uh, frankly, I just don't see them. It pains my heart, Matt. Like as Flames fans, it pains me to say it, but I think you're going to be right. Yeah, I know. It, it's one of those you actually have to show it, you know. And for whatever reason, like this team has just gotten in its own way all year, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. And I, th- I think, like Daryl Sutter said after the Minnesota game this week, in order for uh, in order for this to go anywhere, our best players are going to need to be better. Yeah. And if they're not, why would we get a different result? No. And that's, you know, and as you've said repeatedly throughout the season, well, when are they going to show up? And, you know, like, especially like when we've had good games, like against Buffalo last month or that kind of thing. And, you know, like, where's the consistency? And, you know, like, it, this is what we're seeing. Like, you know, the chips were down heading into the playoffs or uh, trade deadline that, you know, like if you guys want to be in the playoffs, you actually have to show up and they've lost six out of seven. So that kind of tells you what they're all about. And I have to think at some point too, the players have to be giving up at some point. I don't know if that's now or not, but it feels like now maybe the players just realized, you know what? This season's over. Yeah. And no, that, not that, really, but we got, I hate to say it this way, but we're, we're done. We're probably not going to make it. We got none to play for. It's been a rotten, rotten season. We don't care anymore. Yeah. Well, and you saw it at the end of the game yesterday with the camera panning the benches, you know, and like the flames bench and the looks on all of them, the players faces were like, yeah, okay. That happened. Cool. Like there was no visible anger at the performance just you know it was just like kind of looked like everybody had mild indifference on their face which you know that that's not what you want to see when you get thumped like that and you know like it'll how would you say after like this stretch of games uh the dallas game uh on monday is going to be the one that you know, if the Flames actually show up and play well in that game and win that game, there there might still be a pulse with that that team. Uh, you know, but uh, again, they have to actually show up and show it. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you my prediction here. I think the Flames lose Dallas, lose Minnesota, and then they're going to find a way to beat Anaheim. Yeah, which that is to me is also more realistic because Anaheim's just that bad (laughs) yeah but yeah um i think that we're gonna see very quickly here i mean we have dallas minnesota this week we have ottawa vegas dallas again coming up i think that we're gonna start seeing the calgary flames just aren't to the level they need to be to beat their play there would be playoff opponents yep 
And, you know, then we can check in on how good Kenny Augustino's doing. <laughs> you know. Is he still around? I have no idea. <laughs> but we can do updates like we did in the 2013-14 season. Uh, where it's like, um, the only thing to look forward to is how, you know, miscellaneous prospect is doing. And Okay, Kenny Augustino is still playing. I don't want to try and pronounce his team's name here. Uh, <laughs> he's playing for the Nizhny... Novgorod Torpedo of the KHL in 30 games, he has 11 points. Oh, good for him. You know, at least so, he's I mean, got the KHL is a pretty KHL. competitive league. Yep. So you good know, for him. It, it's not like you're playing for the, you know, the French, French league or something. I'd say the KHL is pretty good quality hockey. Yep. Good for so, him to still be going on his career. Yeah. How old is he now? He is 30. So still the, the prime of his career. Yep. Probably sitting in Russia wondering why he's playing in Russia. Um, <laughs> he was there last year as well. Last year he played 46 games and had 40 points. So producing Fairly pretty good. well over in Russia. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah. Good for him, for sure. So <laughs> there you go. Kenny Agostino still playing. We'll uh, we'll have to find some of the other guys. Emil Poirier, News I think, at 11. Is out. Yeah. <laughs> News at 11. <laughs> That's right. That'll be that'll be a f- previous episode or future episodes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Matt, uh, let's hope this is not your prediction. Let's hope the Flames can at least get two points out of this week. But uh, either way, I will talk to you next week. Yeah, yeah. and realistically, they need six if they want to have a chance. But, yeah. What they need and what they can do at this point are very different. Yeah. So, as always, go Flames, go. Even if it's for next year. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson. Co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.